Probably the question I get more than any other question is, how do you read so much? I think what people are really saying is like, how can they read more? All of the Stoics were readers. There is no philosopher who was not obsessed with books. Marcus Aurelius is introduced to the works of, of Epictetus through his tutor, Rusticus. Epictetus falls in love with reading and books and claws his way out of slavery. Seneca falls in love with reading and reading is what sustains him in exile when he's convalescing in Egypt far from home. All of the Stoics loved books. It went to the core of who they were. I wouldn't be here having written now 10 books about Stoicism, having spoken to everyone from the NBA to the NFL, special forces, sitting senators. I wouldn't be here without the books that I've read. I was introduced to the works of Marcus Aurelius when I was 19 years old, and my life was changed in the way that only a book can change your life. So in today's episode, I want to give you a bunch of secrets and strategies and habits to make reading not just a part of your life, but to get the most out of the reading that you're already doing. There's that great line from Epictetus, you can't learn that which you think you already know. The point is to read people you disagree with, to seek out things that you don't know about. You're reading to learn that which you don't already know. There's this great line from the physicist John Wheeler. He says, as our island of knowledge grows, so does the shoreline of ignorance. One of the things I love about books is they introduce me to things that I didn't know about. And even when I, if I read another book about the Civil War, which I've read so many books about, I'm always surprised to learn things that I thought I knew about it, and it turns out I didn't know about this whole other part of it. So we read widely, we read deeply, but we never think we've got it. We never think we know it. We're always looking for more. One of the best pieces of advice I got about reading came from George Raveling, a great basketball coach. He's a mentor of mine, uh, one of the uh, civil rights pioneer. He said that his grandmother called him in to her, her kitchen one day and she said, George, why did the slave masters hide money in books? And he said, I don't know, grandma. And she said, because they knew the slaves would never read them. And what he took from that is, is one, that reading is very valuable. There's a huge ROI in it. And it's true, right? They don't hide money in books anymore, but in a sense they do. Books cost like 10 bucks, but people don't read them. And they don't realize that a book can be the greatest investment you ever make in your life. That's what Warren Buffett said. He said the single best investment he ever made was buying a copy of Benjamin Graham's Intelligent Investor. But what George Raveling told me he took from this was that reading was a moral duty that people had fought and struggled. Frederick Douglass teaches himself to read basically on, under penalty of death. You have to see reading as a moral duty. People struggled and fought and clawed their way to get to a point where books are everywhere and books are easily accessible. So to reject that is just not, it's not just beyond stupid, it's offensive. It's offensive to the people who would have killed for the access to information that you have. So I think about reading as a moral duty, but I also think about it as something that powerful people don't want us to do. And so I'm going to do it for precisely that reason. I want access to this information. Warren Buffett has said that the single greatest investment that he made was a book. He bought this copy of Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor when he was like 19 years old. A paperback book there was probably a dollar, two dollars, and it was now worth a hundred plus billion dollars. That's a pretty good return on investment. But I, again, I think about this. I bought this copy of Meditations for, I think like eight bucks on Amazon in 2006. And it's changed the course of my life. It's returned that 10 bucks many, many times over. You wouldn't be watching this YouTube channel had I not made that investment and I gone, oh, there's a free copy on the internet. Maybe I'll do that. No, great readers, when they see a book they like, they buy it. They don't go, oh, I'll wait for it to come out in paperback or maybe I'll borrow it. No, find a way to get the book, right? Find a way to get it, buy it. Consider the books that you buy an investment because they are. In Meditations, Marcus Aurelius says that just as reading and writing require a master, so does life. Now that's obviously true, but let's go to the first part. He's saying that to be a great reader, you have to have a master, someone who tutors you, who advises you. For Eisenhower, as a young a military officer, uh, Fox Connor, his mentor, begins to pick out and direct a course of reading that shapes his life, that makes him one of the great generals and presidents of all time. Marcus Aurelius himself is introduced to the works of Epictetus through Rusticus, his 
life is changed by this reading master, this person who's instructing him in reading. And actually some of the only letters we have from Marcus Aurelius come from his rhetoric teacher, Fronto, who also directs a course of reading. So the question is, who is leading you, who is teaching you, who is introducing you to new books? Who is your master in reading and writing? If you don't have one, you should get one. I would say the Stoics also remind us that we have to read, and that this is more important than ever, we have to read people that we disagree with. Seneca talks about reading like a spy in the enemy's camp. And my favorite line from, from Seneca, he says, I'll quote a bad author if the line is good. And he does this, he, he, he's not just saying this. In Seneca's letters, the philosopher that he quotes the most is not another Stoic. It's not a philosopher you would think that he would agree with at all. The philosopher that Seneca quotes the most is Epicurus, ostensibly his mortal rival, the school that he would disagree the most with. And that's his point, is that he's reading like a spy in the enemy's camp. And he's quoting Epicurus not just where he disagrees with him and is using, you know, iron sharpens iron and is explaining why he disagrees and why the Epicureans were wrong. For instance, he says the Epicureans believe that we should not be involved in politics if we, if we don't have to be. And Seneca says the, the Stoics are involved in politics, contribute to public life in, unless something prevents us. So they, they have these diametrical differences and Seneca is not afraid to debate these or discuss them but they're also much more aligned than you might think. And he has no problem citing a bad author if the line is good, right? So he's reading deeply, he is intimately familiar with all sorts of schools of philosophy that you might not think he would be or that you might think he might want to push away. So he is adamant about reading people that we disagree with. And to go back to Rusticus's advice to Marcus Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius, I think, following the same, same path, although he never quotes Seneca in any of his writings, it's sort of a peculiar uh, omission. Marcus says that one of the things, and this is what I think we are struggling with as a society when we engage with points that we disagree with, Marcus says that Rusticus teaches him not to fall for every smooth thinker, or a smooth talker. Uh, and his point was, you should be reading the things, you should be engaging with the things. But he doesn't say that you should be sucked down a rabbit hole, that you should lose your your, your, your grasp on reality. You have to still go to the core of what they're saying. You have to put what they're saying to the test and you have to understand it. At the same time, Seneca says we often get way too distracted by surface level details. He was talking about even in his own time, people wanted to know where the events of the Odyssey happened. And he said, they're getting caught up on whether it's real or not, whether Odysseus actually went through this storm or that one. He says, meanwhile, they've got storms going on in their own life. So it can be interesting to get into some of these debates, but at the same time, he's saying the point of reading is to get the moral message, is to get the lesson out of the text. It's good to have recall and take notes and write stuff down, of course, but you're not reading to produce a book report. You're reading for your life to apply these things to your actual life. That's the whole purpose of reading. Whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you're reading to get lessons, to get ideas that you apply to your actual life. Seneca actually says, far too many brains have been afflicted with enthusiasm for pointless knowledge. That's perfectly said. Remember, as Epictetus says, it's not that you read, it's what you read. Are you reading books that are making you better, that are pushing you as a human being? Of course, there's a place for books that are fun, that are entertaining, that are just beautifully written, but at the core of why we read, it should be to become better human beings, better citizens, better parents, better children, better voters, whatever it is. Is what you're reading making you a better person? That's what Epictetus meant when he said, it's not that you read, it's what you read. Everyone, I think, thinks like, oh, I'm literate. I know how to read. But General Mattis talks about functional illiteracy. He says, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you are functionally illiterate, right? And what he means is that people have been doing whatever it is that you're doing. In my case, being a writer, being an entrepreneur, people have been doing that for thousands of years. So if I don't avail myself of their insight, I'm functionally illiterate. I am stupidly preventing myself from understanding their insights. I am learning by experience what I could be learning from the experiences of others. That's why the Stoics understood history. That's why they read widely. They knew it wasn't about just reading a little bit. 
my worry is not that uh, I can't read. I know I can read. But my worry is what Mark Twain said. He said, there's no difference between someone who can't read and doesn't read. They are both illiterate. I fear the illiteracy of not having a wide breadth of understanding of the human condition, of history, of events, of philosophy. So I read widely for that reason. You should not feel shy about beating the hell out of the books that you read. As an author, I could tell you it's a sign that someone actually really respects the book. If it's pristine, if it's if they're taking great care of it, that means they're not putting miles on it. I'll, I'll show you my copy of Meditations. Where is this? Look at this. I've had to tape the cover back on. It's filled with notes, different flags. I have marked almost every page of this book over the years. I've got this is just one of several copies. But the point is, I'm engaging with the material and I'm showing Marcus how important this book is to me. Obviously he's not actually alive, but I'm showing the author the ultimate measure of respect by disagreeing where I disagree, adding where I think it doesn't go far enough, underlining where I think it's great, and then taking the book with me, right? Taking it all over. This is why I made this leather edition, by the way. You can see I'm already beating the crap out of the leather edition I made. I wanted something that could stand up even better. I want something that can travel with me. That Like this copy has been all over the world with me and this copy has now, in the year since it's come out, been in quite a few places, in a lot of backpacks, a lot of suitcases. It's gotten wet at the beach. It's gotten wet by the pool. I've spilled food on it. But the point is, a great reader respects the book by not respecting the book. Maybe you're reading too much. I, I know that sounds crazy. Obviously, one of the virtues of stoicism is, is the virtue of wisdom. But multiple times in meditations, Marcus tells himself to throw away his books, get active in life's purpose while he can. And, and I think that's advice, that's advice I try to give myself. I love reading. I love retreating to the world of ideas. But Marcus Aurelius' mentor, Fronto, he says, against your will, you must put on the purple cloak of the emperor. Meaning, you can't stay here with your books. You can't retreat to the ivory tower. You have to go out in the world and live these ideas, apply these ideas, struggle with difficult people, struggle with difficult challenges, apply this stuff in the imperfect world. Marcus says, don't go around expecting Plato's Republic because you live here in the real world and that's where we apply the philosophy. We stop arguing about what good people are and we try to be one, we try to apply the philosopher in real life where it belongs. Nobody likes having their privacy violated. Nobody likes the way that ads creepily follow you around on the internet. You Google yourself and you find out all the personal information that's out there on the internet. It's there because data brokers make a fortune selling your data and you may well be giving that data away right now and not even know it. If that grosses you out and you don't like it, that's where today's sponsor Aura comes in. With Aura, you can pinpoint the data brokers that are revealing your information and conveniently submit opt-out requests on your behalf. And these brokers are legally obligated to remove your data when they're asked, but they make that process super difficult for a reason and you can let Aura take care of that for you. You get every everything you need at an affordable price. Allow Aura to safeguard your online presence and your data so you can focus on your other responsibilities and have some real peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can let Aura put a stop to it by going to aura.com slash daily stoic today for a two week free trial. And I'll link to it below in today's episode. The world is a lonely place, it's a scary place. We all feel like we're going through stuff. What I think reading does is reading makes you not alone. James Baldwin says, uh, you know, you think your pain is so unique and then you read. Marcus Aurelius felt like, you know, he had the loneliest job in the world. But by studying the other emperors, by studying history, by studying kings, by watching plays in the theater, by reading philosophy, he understood that this is a timeless problem. He understood what his job really was like and what it did to people. And that's why he wasn't corrupted or broken by it. James Baldwin saying, you think your pain is unique and then you read. It gives you insights into other lives, other worlds. To write a book, you have to be so compelled to say something. A book is screaming out, trying to connect with someone. This is the, the hard won wisdom of a person. This is experience, this is pain, this is struggle. And to not avail yourself of that is so stupid. To not talk to people who have been through what you've been through is, is dangerous 
but it's, it's also to do it is to solve the loneliness and isolation that we feel. It's to make us feel connected to other people for all time. You can read, there's this letter from Seneca that he writes, I open my book Stillness is the Key with it, where he's talking about just being busy and trying and trying to focus in his apartment, but there's all these noises. And it's like, I think of that every time I'm trying to write in a, you know, a busy coffee shop or at an airport. I just go like, this is, people have been struggling with this forever. We're all people, we're all going through the same things. Even meditations, like Marcus Aurelius is writing during the Antonine Plague. And you're like, oh, he went through what we are going through right now. And so again, reading softens solitude and makes you not feel alone anymore. One of the things Marx really says that he gets from his philosophy teacher, Rusticus, he says, is to never be satisfied just getting the gist of things. He says, you have to really understand what's going on. You have to really, really understand it. If you're just okay getting the gist of it, read a tweet or a Wikipedia page or watch a documentary or a TikTok. Reading, by definition, is the opportunity to fully understand something, to read it in long form. You gotta go long, you gotta go in depth. Don't be satisfied with getting the gist. Read the intros, look through the footnotes, read a review of the book, right? Read a scholarly work on it also. Read the Wikipedia page about it, watch videos about it also. You wanna truly understand what's happening here and not just be satisfied with some vague surface level understanding. How do we read more? That's the question, right? So, okay, I've, I've convinced you, you should read more. You know you should. What are some really practical ways to do that? Well, I have a couple tips. One, find the time that works for you. So read in the morning. Hugh Jackman has talked about this recently, that he and his wife read aloud to each other in the morning, before the craziness of the day, before they go running around to meetings or, or, or lunches or, any, or, or, or the work that they have to do. He says read in the morning. And, and I like that idea. Um, when I was younger, I used to read in the morning. Now I have young kids, so that's not really my time. But like find the time for, that works for you. So reading in the morning can work really great. The William Osler, who's the founder of John Hopkins Medical School, is a big fan of the Stoics. He recommended that his students read the Stoics or Montaigne or Shakespeare. He says, read before bed, right? He says, um, slow the day down. He's talking about the, relax the relaxing power of reading. That's another great thing. I read before bed every night. I, I try to carve a little time. The other thing I do, I try to read while I do other stuff. So I've talked about this before. When I eat, I, I, I eat go to my, my office and then I read while I eat lunch every day. And that's sort of a quiet time where I read. Yes, this book is 15 years old now, my copy, and there's like Chinese food stains in it from when I lived in Los Angeles and I was reading it. The point is find the time that works for you and then make that time that you read every day. That's really important. I'm not saying you schedule it, but it's like uh, when I eat, I read. I read every day uh, when I wake up. I read every day before bed. I'm also a big binge reader, um, so like I'll go on the sort of spurts, but, but my point is I also have this sort of scheduled reading time and that's why I make time for it. It's not just that you read, but how are you taking notes? How are you recording and capturing that information? These are just some of my note cards. This is my commonplace book, all the notes I have taken on books that I've read. Each one of these, like here, this is the book that I'm working on now. All of these are notes that more or less came out of books that I read. I read a lot of books, right? It's not just that you read as a stoic, but how are you organizing, contextualizing, reworking, working with that information? Think about what Marcus Aurelius's Meditations is. It's filled with quotes. It's filled with fragments of the works from the other philosophers. So how are you organizing and connecting and recording this information so you can draw on it? That it's not just trapped in these different books that you've read. You wanna, you wanna get it from the books, but then get it out of the books, right? And in that process, it also helps you get it into your actual life. So this is a really important practice for the Stokes. I have a whole video on how to keep a commonplace book. I'll, I'll link to that here. You can also check it out in the description. The other thing is this, this idea of reading a page a day. 
Um, obviously, you should read a lot, but I think what I try to do in the Daily Stoic is like go, how can you spend a year with the Stoics? One page, one meditation a day. We also do the Daily Stoic email, which you can sign up for, dailystoic.com slash email. But there's a couple daily books I read. I read this book called uh, A Poem for Every Night of the Year. I read a daily Shakespeare book. I read a, a book that Tolstoy wrote called uh, A Calendar of Wisdom. I, I have all these different daily books that I like. And so reading every day, like one page every day, is a way to just really do a deep dive into some content. I, I would pick different things where you're really just digging deep into the topics. There's like Bible verses a day, uh, books that you can do that, that you might like. Yeah, there's a way they split up the Torah where they read one chapter a week. It doesn't matter. One way to read more is to find, a, just do a little bit every day of one book and then you're, you're just immersed in it over a year. And I think that can be really powerful. One of the best ways to understand the present is of course to study the past. And when you read the Stoics and you read about the Stoics, you get insights into the timelessness, the universalness, the commonalities between human beings that help you understand what is going on in this current moment. Reading about the clash between Cato and Caesar helps you understand the different types of political ambition, right? The different types of politicians that are out there. Reading about the Catiline conspiracy could give you insights into the insurrection on January 6th. Reading about the Antonine Plague, which Marcus Aurelius lived through, gives you insight into COVID. Marcus Aurelius has a line in Meditations. We don't think of Meditations as being a plague book, but it is. He says there's two types of pestilences. There's the plague that destroys your life. And there's the one that destroys your character. He was talking about the cruelty, the indifference, the selfishness that people exhibited in his own time that we saw again in 2020, 21. 2022. And, and the point is, you can read the Stoics, you're reading about ancient Greece and ancient Rome, you're reading about people who were lived so long ago that were seemingly inconceivably different from you, and then you realize they're not at all. So we read the Stoics and we read about the Stoics, we read the period they're in, so we can understand this current moment in a less partisan, in a less politicized, in a less recency bias kind of a way. That's one of the great things about reading philosophy and history. There's a line attributed to Mark Twain, he probably never said it, but he said something like, a person who doesn't read has no advantage over someone who does read. So it's not just, hey, I read every once in a while, but have you really done a deep dive about your profession? Mattis's point about warfare was like, a lot of people have been doing this a long time, thousands of years. And for a soldier, for an officer, not to avail themselves of that knowledge, not to dive deep into that human experience is reckless and irresponsible for the people who are depending on you. So it's not just that you read. You should read deeply. You should read a lot. You should read broadly. The point is, it doesn't matter that you can read, that you're good at reading. It matters, are you putting the muscle to it, the time into it, and reading a lot? Great readers quit books that suck. And I say that as an author. If you want to quit my book, it's because I didn't do a good job making you want to go from page to page to page. There's a story from Epictetus. He overhears one of his students bragging about having read all of the works of Chrysippus. Chrysippus supposedly wrote 700 books. He was very dense, very long-winded, very complex writer. And Epictetus says, you know, if Chrysippus was a better writer, you'd have less to be proud of. And his point was soldiering through some crappy, boring, long-winded, conceited, contradictory book. That's not good and it's not a good use of your time. So great readers quit books. You don't quit a book just because you're a little confused or it's too hard, but the idea is you can quit books that aren't doing it for you. You have to know that. And I quit books all the time. Sometimes I go back to them. Sometimes I realize I was the problem and not the book. But the point is, if you're finishing every book you've ever started, you're probably not reading as many books as you could read. It's not just that you read, but that you reread. Seneca says we want to linger on the works of the master thinkers. So here's my copy of Seneca, myself, and I have, you can see there's different highlighting, different pens, because I've read it more than once. And every time I read it or pick it back up, I get something else out of it. I've read this translation. This is a different translation of uh, the first 65 of the letters. And so I've read not just one translation, but multiple translations. The idea is you go back to the books. This is another Stoic idea they get from Heraclitus that we never step in the same river twice. And so it's not just reading, but rereading, because you get something different out of it each time. Like here's my 
copy of Gatsby, which I read in high school. This is the copy I got in ninth or 10th grade. So I read it in my teens, I read it in my 20s, I've read it in my 30s. I've read it many, many times. I was just going back over something in this book for the Justice book that I'm writing right now in the Stoke Virtue series. The idea is that each time I go back to it, the book is the same, but I am different. The world is different. And thus, uh, we benefit by not just reading, but also rereading. Probably the best investments I've ever made in my life have been books. You buy something for 15 bucks, you get something for a penny on Amazon and it changes your life. Those are the books that I try to seek out, that I try to read, and those are also the books that I recommend. If you're looking for some books that will change your life, I have an email for you. I send it out once a month, no spam, nothing else, just a couple book recommendations that I think you'll like. You can sign up at ryanholiday.net slash reading list.